one of the best ways to access the pure state of meditation is by relaxation. Because our minds are so busy and we're so caught up and we're thinking about so many things and there's so much going on in our life, even if you're a quiet person, you still probably have a lot of input coming into your mind. So when it's time to just be quiet, it seems that the mind doesn't become quiet by itself. So then we think, oh, I must control my mind. I must make my mind quiet. I must pin my mind down and force it to be quiet. You can do that. There are many techniques for forcing your mind to be quiet. But there's another way. And it's the way that I share vipassana, and it's more gentle. It's more open. It's more relaxing. In fact, it is about trusting the goodness of your mind. By the way, if you want to take any notes, I really recommend taking notes. Sometimes I talk too much and uh, I give a lot of information and some of the information is really good. Some of it I haven't even heard before myself. So I'm actually learning from myself as well. Um, by the way, I've never, I've never done this talk or this practice. I've done other ones, but I've never done this one. As you can see, I don't have any notes. I haven't prepared anything. I don't know what's going to happen today. You don't know what's going to happen today. So that's lesson number one. I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, so actually just say that to yourself in your mind. I don't know what's going to happen today. Okay, so I have a little, I have a, what I can call a, it's like a motto, or it could be a mantra, but a mantra is more like a meditation that you repeat over and over and over again. I'm sure you've heard what a mantra is, but this is, uh, I can call it a reminder, or I can also call it like a motto, something that you frequently bring to mind, or yeah, something that you remind yourself. So through this practice, and I, as I said, it's been 30 years now that I've been practicing predominantly vipassana meditation. Uh, as um, Ke Hui said, earlier. I was a Buddhist monk for nine years in the Myanmar tradition, in the Burmese tradition. So, <clears throat> and it's been all vipassana. What I've learned, so when I sit down to meditate, I realize that I would have expectations. What am I going to get? I want to get something from this meditation. I want to achieve something. I want to get something. I want to make something. So then I started to realize and understand, also my teachers have already said it, that expectations are blockages in your meditation practice. If you're expecting to get something, then you're probably not going to get it. And also you may not get anything else because your mind is looking at what you want and not at what you've got. If you want to get insight, if you want to understand the true nature of body and mind, you have to look at what you've got, not at what you want. If you look at what you want, you're kind of looking at the future, but you can't see the future. So your mind is somewhere grasping searching for something else that's not present. I want to have that experience. I want to get this from meditation. I want that from meditation. It's not bad in a sense that, okay, you're aspiring and you are looking for something, but you have to let go of that. If you don't let go of that, your mind is just in the future. So this first little thing that I'm sharing with you is I don't know what will happen. When you sit down to meditate, just tell yourself, I don't know what will happen. And even say it a few times, I don't know what will happen. 
I don't know what will happen. I don't know what will happen. Actually, this works because it is the truth. Do you know what's going to happen in your sitting meditation when you sit down at the beginning? You can't know, can you? Actually, we don't know the future. Do you know that? When I was in my first retreat in Australia, we were in the forest and it was a first Vipassana retreat. And the teacher was giving a beautiful talk at night talking away, and then he said, the future doesn't exist. And it was like a bombshell hit me. It was like my head exploded. It was like, the future doesn't exist. And it was like, it was shocking, because it was like, wait, what do you mean the future doesn't exist? What are we all working for? And then I suddenly realized, my whole life I've been in the future. I'm always thinking, where am I going? What am I doing? What will I say? What, you know, my mind was always out there. And all of a sudden, it was like, I realized that it was not, nothing was true. I wasn't living my true life. I wasn't living in the present moment. I was living in the future, always planning, always speculating, which is not a bad thing when you plan and speculate, but you have to do it in the present, knowing now I'm planning, now I'm speculating, now the mind is in the future. There's a big difference between being lost in the future and knowing in the present, ah, I'm planning the future. I know, what's, I know what I'm doing now. So then I was also disappointed because I thought, well, all my life, I'd lived my, I'd lived my life just thinking about the future. I was also, I was a bit angry that nobody told me. 29 years of my life and nobody told me, hey, the future doesn't exist. Everybody's talking about the future and I'm like, yeah, cool, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, let's dream, you know, what's your five-year plan and all these things. And it's like, wait, that doesn't exist. And it's like, uh-huh, that's right, it doesn't exist because, it can't exist because it hasn't happened yet. It's okay to have a plan, but you plan in the present and you know, now I am planning in the present. I am making a plan now. This is planning. It's not the future. But I didn't know that. I just was, my mind was just in the future. Literally, it can't be in the future. But dreaming fantasizing, imagining, speculating. Whew, back to the present. So I had many experiences just from that one bit of information. The future doesn't exist. So then during my med long meditation retreats and meditation practices over the years, I came to understand that I don't know the future, I don't know what's going to happen, and then I thought, well, actually anything can happen. If you don't know what's going to happen, then anything can happen. Something wonderful, a miracle could happen right here, today. Why not? There's an, we live in a sea of possibility. This is what I learned from quantum the teachings of quantum, is that we live in a sea of possibilities. But what we do is because we're conditioned, we tend to just choose the same choices all the time. Like today, you, choose, you chose to come here. But if you think about it, what were all the other possibilities that you could have done today? You could have met your friends, you could have gone shopping. Actually, you know, you could have done pretty much anything. You could have just gone to KLIA randomly and just said, what's the next flight? And buy a ticket and get on that flight and go to that place, wherever it was. You could have done that today. You wouldn't, because that's not in your scope of your, your safe possibilities. 
But you could have done anything. You could get in your car, you could drive to Singapore, you could go to Thailand. You could have done anything. You go to the beach, you go to the forest, go to the mountains, go anywhere. There's a sea of possibilities that we live in, but we fix in these few little conditioned, random, not random, actually they're rather controlled, choices that we continuously make. So this is also what I like to, um, I like to explore these possibilities as well. So I don't know what will happen. Anything could happen. Something bad could happen. And people sometimes dwell on all the bad things that could happen. Oh, I could get sick. Oh, I could get hurt. Oh, something could go wrong. Some, you know, something bad could happen. So there's a 50-50 chance something good could happen, something bad could happen. The truth is, I don't know. So just come back to, I don't know. Could be good, could be bad, I don't know. I think Ajahn Brahm says that, doesn't he? Something good, bad, who knows? Yeah. So, just come back to that. Who knows? Actually, I don't know. Oh, that's right. What I'm talking about now fits perfectly into Ajahn Brahm's um, good, bad, who knows? So then, the third part is about attitude, I will just watch and learn from whatever happens. So whatever happens, I'm just going to watch and learn from whatever happens. So these are the three points. The first one is, I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. I will watch and learn from whatever happens. This, I will watch and learn from whatever happens, is opening your mind up also to possibilities. It's in line with the first two points, meaning I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. Let whatever comes, let it come, and let me learn from that. So, this is the right attitude, I believe, for everything in life, is to be prepared to learn. Be ready to learn. People call me a teacher. I don't see myself as a teacher. I'm still learning. And I think if people start to really believe that they are the teacher and that they know everything, then it's like they're cutting off their, their possibilities. For me, I believe I live in a sea of possibilities, so I keep opening up to those, that sea of possibilities. That means I can always learn something new. I can always have a new experience. So this keeps my mind fresh. It keeps my life fresh, in fact. So these are the three points. I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. I will just watch and learn from whatever happens. And if you go into any meditation with that attitude, then you're ready to learn. Vipassana is a tool for learning. Sati, mindfulness, is what the Buddha was teaching. This mindfulness is opening your mind up to be aware, to be mindful of anything that is happening in your body and mind in the present moment. So that's all we're doing. We're just opening up. What's happening now? It's not, now I have to sit down and I have to watch my breath. Now I have to sit down and I have to watch the movement of my abdomen. Now I have to sit down and I have to repeat some mantra or I have to do some specific process. What if you sit down and you open your mind and you ask almost, let's ask, like, what's happening now? What am I feeling now? What am I experiencing now? What's happening in my body now? What's happening in my mind now? So I think somebody, uh, they, they also have um, referred to Buddhism as, a, um, as open inquiry. So the Buddha always invited inquiry and to um, ask questions and to try and see for yourself. 
So this is one thing that you can uh, take not only into meditation, but you can take it into your life, wherever you go. There was a time when this was very strong for me, that actually it was, it was so strong, this idea that I don't know. And I would wake up in the morning and I would just think, well, I don't know what's going to happen today. And I'd step out the front door and I'd think, well, I don't know what's going to happen. You think, oh, I'm going to walk to my car, I'm going to get in my car, I'm going to go and I'm going to park there, and I'm going to go there, I'm going to do this, I'm going to work, I'm going to have this, eat at this place, and I'm going to meet my friend, I'm going to do, 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 do. And you might have a plan, what you're going to do, but you don't know what's going to happen. You think you know what's going to happen, but that's living in an illusion. You're living in an idea of what you think will happen. But the truth is only ever in your experience in the present moment. The truth is only ever in your experience in the present moment. The truth isn't out there. The truth isn't in a book or in a teacher or on the internet somewhere. The truth is in your experience in the present moment. And you always have access to it. When you access the truth, when you experience the truth, your mind is very stable, it's very strong, it's very connected, it's connected to reality. Have you ever seen, uh, the, there's a Buddha image, a mudra, you know how the Buddha has these various mudras and um, hand placements? There's one of the Buddha's mudras, and you'll see that his hand is like this, it's touching the earth. So he is, in that mudra, he is, they say, it's called calling the earth to witness. But what he was doing, well, it, my interpretation or my understanding of that was he was grounding himself, he was earthing himself, he was basically saying that I am as unshakable as the earth, so, or I have the strength of the earth. So if anything wants to um, uh, attack me, sway me, change me, or anything like that, I actually can call on the earth and I am connected to the earth. So this is what we call grounding or earthing. It's a beautiful thing and I, I wish we were outside because I'd get you all to, you've already got your shoes off, but we'd all, in fact I did it just outside here the other day when I arrived early. There's a tiny little patch of grass out there and the grass is really beautiful. So I just took my slippers, my sandals off and I just stood on the grass for a while because I also live in a condominium at the moment, although I go down and I, I go swimming and I go barefoot. But it's not very often that we walk barefoot on the earth. And as humans, we are still kind of like animals. We have our intellect, which separates us from animals, but we have these bodies that are actually supposed to living from the earth. So our food, our fruits and vegetables come from the earth. Even if you eat meat or other things, all of these things come from the earth. We're breathing the air from around, we're drinking the water. We are connected to these four elements. And so as a human being, you should be connected to the earth physically, either barefoot or sitting down or laying down, every day, if you can, you should kick your shoes off and stand just on the earth. Even if you stand on the concrete, it's okay. Um, up here, a few stories up, we're a little bit disconnected from the earth, and I think this material is plastic, so it doesn't connect us to the earth. The earth has electricity, and the body has electricity. And the body needs to earth, it needs to connect 
to that electricity, that earth electricity. You know how you feel when you actually go for a walk in the forest or you, you do take your shoes off or when you go to the beach and you walk barefoot on the beach? It's Generally, it's a lovely feeling as long as you're not afraid of creepy crawlies or something like that. But when you do connect to nature, you feel happy, you feel calm, you feel more peaceful. So what I'll do today is I'll offer you some uh, meditation techniques for um, calming and relaxing. The first one I'm going to do with you is my standard uh, first meditation that I like to introduce people to. <clears throat> Mainly because people, people believe that meditation is this, sitting still. So I run with that and I show them a sitting meditation. So let's start with that. Um, is there anybody who hasn't meditated before? Anybody new to meditation? Okay, so you've all done a little bit. Okay, a little bit maybe. Yeah, that's okay. It really doesn't matter because I'm going to share my, my style with you anyway. So the first one I'm going to offer you is a, uh, a sitting meditation and it will be a breathing meditation. So when I teach and share any meditation techniques, I always ask people, well, sometimes I vary, but usually I'm asking to just let the breath flow by itself. So there's no need to control the breath or do anything with the breath. So what I ask, will ask you to do, and you can even just check it now for yourself, is just feel the air as it enters your nostrils and exits at the same point. So we're kind of focusing where you feel the in-breath into your nostrils and you feel the out-breath at the same point. So we're not following the breath deeply into the body, we're just feeling the sensation of the air at the opening of the nostrils, both the in-breath and the out-breath at the same point. So, being in air conditioning, you feel a slightly cooler sensation coming in. You feel a slightly warmer sensation going out. So what I'm going to do, we haven't started yet, I'm just explaining it to you. What I'm going to do after a while, I'm going to ask you to count. So as you feel the in-breath, you count one. When you feel the out-breath, you count one. In-breath two, out-breath two. In-breath three, out-breath three. In four, out four, out five. In five, out five. And then start back at one again. It's very simple, but what this is doing is helping you to concentrate. It's helping you to be more present. So we're focusing on two things. One is the sensation of the breath, and two, we're just getting the numbers right. In breath one, out breath one. In breath two, out breath two. In three, out three. Four, four, five, five. Start back at one again. Keep going in the cycle. After a while, I'll ask you to stop counting the out breath. So you count the in breath and just feel the out breath silently. So it'd be like in one, two, so we're feeling, and then after a while I'll ask you to stop counting. So we'll drop the counting and we'll just be left with the breath. And that's what I want you to experience, is just the sensation of the breath. Usually because you've been counting, your thoughts have already, there are very few thoughts. Hopefully what you'll experience is some breaths without any thought. Let's see what happens. So, we're going to go on this little journey. So, uh, the way I recommend to sit for meditation is to sit up on a, on a cushion, have something under your feet. So, don't sit with your feet on the floor because 
it will get painful. <coughs> I tend to sit with my feet one in front of the other. So I pull one foot into the groin and then I just put one foot in front. I don't cross my legs like that and because you get a pressure point and it gets painful. So if you want to sit longer, it's better to sit with your legs parallel to each other. Um, some people find it uncomfortable. Some people's feet, uh, legs stick up in the air. Then it's better to sit on two cushions or something like that. Um, sometimes it's also because of the clothes you're wearing also it doesn't help you to sit comfortably. So then um, put your hands wherever you like. I quite like this position because it, uh, it rotates, the hands rotate out, the wrists rotate out, the elbows rotate in, the shoulders ro rotate out, which means then you tend to open your chest more easily. So you, you're opening up your, your breathing. You're also making your posture better. So sitting up on a cushion, a little bit higher cushion, also rolls your, your pelvis forward, which then <clears throat> naturally straightens your back. It's always good to have a good posture. An interesting thing, uh, last year, yeah, it was last year, I went to India and I did my yoga teacher training in India. And I've been doing yoga for many years, but I didn't under, I had never done a course to learn all the, the philosophy and everything. And I heard that the kind of creator or the father of yoga, Patanjali, what he said was yoga is so that we may sit with a straight spine. It's like the whole teaching of yoga is so that you can sit like this. And it's like, well, can't we sit like this and not do yoga? Is it okay? But the point is that if you want to meditate, so yoga is not just all the, the different forms of movement and the postures. It's actually a teaching that is directing you how to meditate properly. So yoga is actually preparation for meditation. And this also then, if in the Buddha's teaching, <coughs> meditation is the path to enlightenment. So yoga and meditation are on this path to enlightenment. So we may practice sitting in a, an upright posture. Another thing that is great to do, which many people don't do, and that is we tend to hunch forward, especially now we're on computers, we're using our phones, our shoulder, shoulders are rolling forward. So what you'll hear me say today is roll your shoulders up and back and down. <laughs> and now, as if somebody is just taking a few hairs at the top of your head and just lift yourself up a little bit taller. Just grow a little bit taller and then relax. And just feel how it feels to sit in this more energetic posture. This is the sitting meditation posture, been practiced for thousands of years. So, <clears throat> just feel where your body connects with the cushion. There's something that you've been, oh, and gently close your eyes. We close our eyes because our practice here is to see inwardly. So we don't need to see the external world anymore. We've done a lot of that. We've been doing it all of our lives. Another thing you've been experiencing all your life is gravity. Every moment of your life, you've been pulled down to this earth. You've had no choice in it. We all have no choice. We are all experiencing gravity all the time. No matter what you do, even swimming, floating on water, you're still being pulled down to the earth. So 
Feel now where your body connects with the cushion. Feel the pressure. Feel the weight of the body, the heaviness of the body. Feel the contact with the cushion. And feel the pressure points. Notice where there seems to be more pressure and less pressure. And also at those pressure points, even choose one pressure point, you may feel heat. And you may feel heat in all of the pressure points and contact points. Notice that your mind is in the present now. It's not in the past, it's not in the future. You're just having a present moment experience. Your mind is also probably not stressed, not worried, not afraid, not angry. It's probably not really negative at all. Now feel your hands touching. Your hands are also under the law of gravity. Feel your left hand. Feel where it touches your leg or your other hand. Feel that contact point and feel the heat at that point. And feel your right hand. Feel the contact point. Can you feel the palm, the center of the palm of your right hand? Can you feel the chi, some energy right in the center of the palm of your right hand? slight tingling sensation, a little vibration, a little energy, a little pressure, this chi. You may now also feel it in the left. It's always there, but just more aware, more mindful, more present. And if you like, you can feel that chi up your arms to your shoulders. Again, relax your shoulders up and back and down. And relax your face. And relax your whole body. As you breathe in, relax your whole body. And as you breathe out, Relax your whole body. Enjoy breathing in. Enjoy breathing out. Celebrate life with each breath. This breath is fresh and new. Bringing new life to your body. New oxygen to your blood to your cells. And this new breath has never happened before. It will never happen again. Every breath is unique. Every breath is impermanent. Start to feel the coolness of the scent, the coolness of the in breath, and the warmth of the out breath. Just feel the sensation, let the breath breathe normally.
And now as you breathe, you may begin counting. In breath one, out breath one. In breath two, out breath two. Keep going, up to five, start back at one again. Now stop counting the out-breath. Only count the in-breath and feel the out-breath silently. And now stop counting. Feel the breath silently. Notice thoughts start to enter the mind. It's just thinking. Notice it. Gently come back to your breath again and relax.
And now feel your breath coming deeper into your body. Feel your chest moving with the breathing. Feel your upper body move as you breathe. And expand your awareness to feel your whole body sitting here and now. We have five physical senses. One sense is the sense of feeling. Just feel your body. And now switch your awareness to hearing. And be aware of smelling. And tasting. And even when your eyes are closed, what do you see behind your eyelids? Some color? some light, something moving, changing. Or perhaps it's just black. Your five senses are always working, day and night. There is no off switch. And your mind is working. Check yourself. Am I aware? Am I relaxed? Am I present? my thinking just ask yourself am I thinking or ask yourself what is my next thought usually there isn't one And check if there's any emotion. How do I feel now? Can you name any feeling, any emotion? In this way, all of our senses are working and our mind is working. All the organs and systems of the body are working. They're all doing their job. Actually, everything is working perfectly. All your organs, all your systems, all your senses, your mind, it's all working perfectly. Can you trust this? Can you trust the natural elements, characteristics, and systems of your body. Even pain arises and passes away. The numbness comes and goes. Itchiness comes and goes. Discomforts come and go.
if we can be patient. When you are ready, in your own time, feel free to open your eyes. Feel free to move your body. And sit comfortably, relax, have a little stretch if you like. So what I've shown you just now is a little bit of a mixture of two styles of meditation. If you focus only on your breath, it's called Samatha meditation or uh, like a concentration meditation because you're only focusing on one thing, that's the breath. But Vipassana that I've been talking to you about and that's my speciality is doesn't have any fixed object of awareness. It's you open your mind up. I, today, just now, I went through the five physical senses. So we were focusing on the breath, which is part of the physical body. Then we expanded and felt the body sitting here. That's the sense of feeling. And then there was the sense of hearing, smelling, tasting, and even the sense of seeing, even though the eyes are closed. And then in Buddhism, we talk about the sixth sense, sorry, sixth sense, and that is the, the sense of the mind. The mind also um, has intuition. So your mind can know something that doesn't come through your senses. So the mind usually relies on what it sees, what it hears, what it smells, tastes and feels to actually know something. But the mind can know something without the senses. That's called intuition. Knowing something simply by knowing. Or can also be through thought. So a thought can also help us and help us to know something. So uh, usually the sixth sense we refer to simply as the mind. So that would include thinking and emotions and intuition as well. Sometimes when uh, people do the counting of the breaths. Sometimes uh, people think quite a lot and sometimes they can't even get to five because there's a thought interrupting the flow. It's perfectly normal. That's what we do. Actually, we are really just thinking machines. When you think about it and you think about how much you think every day, uh, they even measured it. I, it's amazing what they can do these days. They, they measure thoughts and they say something like, they get different, different numbers, but something like 60,000 thoughts we can have in a day. Actually, if you ask me, it would be more like 60 million. So I include all the tiny little, you know, beep, 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 just bits and pieces of thoughts that come and go. It's a bit like, when you go to the beach and you and the wind's blowing and the waves are coming, you might say, oh, there's a big wave. But if you look on each wave, there's actually lots of tiny little waves, like ripples on, on every wave. So there's, that's what I, how I see the mind. There are the big thoughts that we can count or that are obvious and that maybe our brain responds to. But then I think there are many little sub-thoughts that are coming in and out all the time. So uh, sometimes we, we can't even get to five because there's a thought has interrupted. Sometimes we 
some people are really good, they can, and I've even done it myself, um, you're counting, but you're also thinking. And so you get to five, and then you go six, six, seven, and you go, oh, no, I'm supposed to stop at five. And then you go back to five again, uh, go back to one again. Sometimes when I ask people to stop counting, they will, um, they still keep counting. It's like the mind got used to the counting technique and it still wants to keep counting, especially when I say stop counting altogether. Sometimes the mind wants to keep counting, it got comfortable in that. But what I hope you experienced was at least some breaths without any thoughts. That there were, there should have been just two experiences. One is the sensation of the breath and two is the awareness of the sensation of the breath. Just two experiences. At that time, if you were able to do that, then your mind was not in the past, it was not in the future, it wasn't planning something, it wasn't worrying about something, it wasn't trying to create something, it wasn't trying to get something or get rid of something. The mind at that time was only aware of one thing, the in-breath, and then it was aware of the out-breath, and that's all. In a way, we can call this the purification of the mind, especially if you had no thoughts. There was no talking in the mind, there was no um, opinion, no judgment, no liking, disliking, good, bad, uh, pleasant or unpleasant. Just the sensation of the in-breath and awareness and the sensation of the out-breath and awareness. So this also um, some of you probably fell asleep or at least had a little, had a little nod and just um, had a little bit of sleepiness. Also perfectly normal. Maybe you got up early this morning. Maybe you didn't have your coffee this morning. Maybe you um, had a late night. Um, most of us are running on what I call... Um, nervous energy or stressful energy. Most of us have already, we are living at a stressful level. Just living in the city will, will mean that most people are already running on a kind of stress all the time. So what happens when I run retreats, people come for a retreat and the first day on retreat People are so tired. They're just, they're wiped out. They're exhausted, in fact. And it usually takes two or three days for their natural energy to come back. I don't let people drink coffee on retreat, so I take that away. So people usually use that to stimulate their mind. But when they don't have that, then they're, they're falling asleep. <coughs> what it shows me is that pretty much everybody is tired, if not exhausted. So that's why I also I'm, I said we're going to do some relaxation today. So already, if you were able to follow that breathing technique, you probably feel a little bit fresher in your mind, especially when you're able to even just follow a few breaths without any thoughts, then the mind starts to feel a little bit fresher. So just while you're sitting there now, it's not meditation, but I just want you to check, can you feel an in-breath without any thought? It's like just a silent in-breath. And can you have a silent out-breath? Can you have a silent in-breath and out-breath? Like one cycle of a breath. Just without any thought. Could you do that? Yeah? It's not too difficult, is it? And how does it feel? It's kind of nice, isn't it? A little holiday from thinking. A little holiday from yourself. A little holiday from responsibilities and having to be someone or do something or get something, get rid of something. It's a nice little holiday. And that's all you have to do, just one breath. One in-breath, 
one out breath. If you can, do two. If you can keep going, then keep going. You don't have to count how many breaths you're doing. Counting breaths doesn't mean anything. Even what I showed you before, the counting up to five, it actually doesn't, it has no symbolic meaning. It's just when you engage a word with your experience, you will, um, you will actually be more concentrated. That's all it is, a little concentration technique. So see if you can practice this anywhere, anytime, even while you're sitting in your car waiting for the red light. I call it red light meditation. You just sit there and you just stare at the red light or where the green light is, isn't yet. So you're sitting in a red light, just stare at where the green light's going to come on and just do a couple of little breaths. Just can you, can you just take an in-breath without any th thought? Switch off the radio, especially if you're by yourself, or even if you've got someone in the car but they're not talking, or maybe it's a friend and you want to practice together, or your kids or anybody else, and even teach them this. It's so simple, but it's actually really quite effective. Can you have an in-breath without any thought? Can you have an out-breath without any thought? Can you have an in-breath and an out-breath without any thought? And then, just let it continue, let it slide. One question. Good. So what like, counts as no thought? Because I usually think of the word breathe in, or think of my breath, but what counts as no thought? Yeah, okay, it's a good question, I'm glad you asked. So, if you're saying to yourself, breathe in, breathe out, then that's a, that's a thought. It's, it's words, there's concepts, there's something, some mental activity there. And if you are somehow imagining your breath, maybe you're seeing a mental picture of what the breath is in your mind's eye, on the screen of your mind, you're kind of... I actually used to catch myself doing this. I had various ways of imagining what my breath looked like until I realized I can't see my breath. I don't know what my breath looks like. Why is my mind even making up pictures or graphic images about what my breath looks like? It doesn't lead it anywhere. So you don't need any graphic image of, you know, the breath goes like this or it goes like that or it goes like this or it goes like that. It doesn't matter. These things can all be deleted. In fact, the best thing you can do is just clear the screen of your mind so that you don't see anything. So let's just actually practice that. Mm, okay, so just close your eyes. It's not a meditation, so you don't have to change your position. Just close your eyes. I want you to imagine... Um, the first thing you did when you got out of bed this morning. So it's not imagining, you're actually remembering. But do you see it on the screen of your mind? You can see something like what you did this morning. And then, what did you see when you arrived in this building this morning? And now, can you remember what I look like sitting here? With your eyes closed. Do you see that's the stuff on the screen of your mind? Now I want you to clear that screen. Just delete it. See the screen as blank. Can you hear that your mind is silent? Can you feel that your body is still? Stillness Silence, and let's call it space, the emptiness or the screen of the mind is blank. Stillness in your body, space on the screen of the mind, and silence. Okay, that's all. How did that go? Could you get that? Is there a, does that work for you? Yeah? Is, does anybody... Yeah. Um, I have a question. Great. Uh, thinking of perceptions is 
the universal uh, mental factors, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite possible we can stop. Even we can have thought of perception of thinking, and we just aware what's going on. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, perception doesn't stop. That's for sure. You can't, you're not stopping perception, you're not stopping the mind. Actually, we're not stopping anything. Nothing that I'm teaching you here is teaching you to stop anything. I'm only asking you to watch what is happening. But when you are able to do as I just suggested, and that is, so just clearing the screen of the mind, that is to not see anything on the mind, in the mind's eye, were you, were you able to do that? Yeah, yeah, right, but um, sometimes are you able to do it? Have you ever noticed that, oh, the mind is blank or black or space or clear? Does that happen sometimes? You're, you're a meditator, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. But what about before when I asked the question, what is my next thought? Did you have a thought? There is awareness to the aware happening. Uh-huh. Yes. Correct. That's awareness. Yeah. That's an awareness technique. Yeah. So let's just do that little exercise again. Come in. You don't have to run. It's all right. <laughs> You're not late. So, you're just in time, we're going to do the fastest meditation in the world, yeah? The quickest meditation in the world, okay? So, you don't have to prepare for this, but it will be good if you just close your eyes and just be still for a second and just ask yourself, what is my next thought? So, just ask it again. What is my next thought? So I think that's it, that's the end of the meditation. <laughs> I told you, it's the quickest meditation in the world. And most people, at least for a split second, when they ask that question, there is a, a moment when there's no thought. It's like you have to stop thinking to see if you're thinking. It's like you have to stop to see what is happening in the mind. So everybody can have that at least a little experience of momentarily not having a thought in the mind. So what I'm doing in this practice and what I've just shared with you, I use these three concepts to actually enter into meditation. So the first one is the stillness of the body. So as I'm sitting here now, actually the body can never be perfectly still. The body is always moving, there's always there's chi, there's energy, there's vibration, there are so many things happening in the body, it's never perfectly still. But because there is no intention to move, we can call it a relative stillness. When I feel the stillness of the body, and then when I clear the screen of the mind, that is what I call space, then I don't see my body, I have no mental image of my body, it's actually as if the body dissolves because I'm only experiencing stillness and space, and then I hear the silence of the mind. Stillness, space, and silence. And the effect is there is no thought in the mind. There is no activity on the screen of the mind. There are no actions, movements, things playing out. There's no memories. There's no projections into the future. And the body is dissolved. You can't feel the body. There is no body to experience at that moment. And it can last a little bit longer as you start to get more 
experienced at it. This is what's called the purification of the mind. It's a very simple... It's, a, it's an entering into... It's the... Um, I can't remember whether it's Upachara Samadhi or Apana Samadhi, but it is a Samadhi state. But it's coming, actually, we're experiencing this more through uh, Vipassana than we are through um, forcing the mind. So Samatha, the Samatha meditation and concentration meditations are often forcing the mind to stay fixed on a state. But this is more of an invitation. It's, a more, it's much more relaxing. Because all I'm doing is I'm sitting still, I'm coming into stillness, and I'm noticing the stillness of the body. Maybe for many of you, it's, you're not able to actually feel the stillness, perhaps in the way that I can feel it. Of course, I have a lot of experience, so it's much easier for me to understand and feel the stillness of the body. But even relatively, I think you can feel, ah, the body is still. And then, when you clear the screen of the mind, there's nothing on the screen, it's like blank. And then you listen to what, listen to the mind, I say listen to the silence of the mind. Even just one moment, you can have an experience of stillness, space and silence. And there, I think pretty much most people can experience no thought, just for uh, at least a moment. And then, as you practice, you can, this can become a longer and longer state of experience. It's very simple. It's actually so simple that most of us can't do it. You know, our lives are so complicated and we, we, we try so hard to do so many things that if it's too simple, it's like, huh? Like, huh? What do you mean? It's like, huh? I just watch my in-breath and my out-breath. How do I do that? Can you give me an app to help me? Like, you know, can, the, <laughs> can you explain it a bit more? It's like, just breathe in <laughs> and just breathe out and don't, and just have that experience of just the sensation of the breath. So this is, um, I like to use the breath to access states of calm in the mind. And yes, this is, this is a samatha meditation. Many vipassana teachers will use the breathing to calm the mind first and then open up into the um, awareness of what are the other senses and what's happening in the body and mind. So, Mm. Yeah. Then, were there any questions about that breathing meditation that we did, or that experience, or any comments, or anything you'd like to say about that experience of the, the breathing meditation with the counting, and then slowly letting go of the counting? Don't be shy. Yep. Just speak up a bit more. So when we are counting our breaths, and eventually we let it go. So sometimes maybe a thought will arise, and uh, so we let kind of sustain um, application to just observe it, without pushing it away. Yeah. But um, is there like a guideline on how long we allow the thought to stay, and when do we decide, okay, I can just watch it, and it sees by itself, mm. and when? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that you won't hear me teaching is how to suppress thoughts, how to kill thoughts, how to get rid of thoughts. Um, what I'm doing is I'm watching the nature of thought. So because thinking is happening so often throughout our day, it's not that we have to stop it or kill it or get rid of it, but see the nature of it. What is the nature of thought? What does thought do? Why do we even think? 
Do you know? Why do we think? It's a really interesting question. It's like we're having all of these thoughts all day long from the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep. And at the time we go to sleep, it's like we've thrown them all in the garbage bin. They've all finished. We go to sleep, we have our sleep, we wake up and we start thinking again the next day. A whole new batch of thoughts. So what's the purpose of it all? What do we get from all of those thoughts in the day? Yes, we might get some answers, we might get some good ideas, we might make some plans, we might um, maybe learn from some mistakes or something like that. But there are a lot of thoughts that really don't make sense and that are really unnecessary. So why are we having all of those thoughts? What's causing thoughts? Where are thoughts coming from? So in Vipassana, it's not about stopping thoughts. It's not about getting rid of thoughts. But what I found is that if I gently apply my awareness to any experience, and I observe it with some degree of interest or curiosity or investigation, not really analyzing because that would be more thinking, but pure experience, the thoughts fall away by themselves. The other thing that we can do is when we, often when we see a thought and we are aware that we are thinking, usually the thought disappears by itself because something else has happened. There's a shift in the process of the mind. So a thought arises and you're in thinking mode, but then awareness arises and you see the thought. Often the awareness replaces the thinking. It usually just happens naturally. The thought will often fall away by itself. And many of you are meditators and you've already noticed that, that sometimes you're aware of a thought and it's already gone. And then you're aware of another thought and it's already gone. It's almost like playing some kind of like a video game or something. It's like pew, pew, pew. It's like thinking, thinking, thinking. Um, my teacher, and this is to answer your question, if there is a technique that we can use, my teacher from, uh, so that's Chamye Siado, Siado Ujanika, who was directly under Mahasi Siado, a great Vipassana master in Myanmar. His technique is to label thinking. So you can actually say to yourself, thinking, 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 thinking. Now what happens here is you're, you're thinking, so your mind is in the process of thinking, but then the labeling process replaces the thinking process. So when you say thinking, 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 you're actually not thinking anymore. You're labeling. So then the thought falls away and then you stop labeling what's left. Huh? Hopefully there's silence. Maybe another sneaky little thought has popped up in its place and went, oh, wow, that was cool. I just labeled that thought and then it, what? What's this? Another thought. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Or maybe you're feeling happy about your meditation or proud of yourself. Then these things also need to be observed. But um, on an innocent level where a thought arises and we just label thinking, 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 often the thought falls away. Then you don't need to label anymore. Then there is a silence in the mind or an... Uh, a, um, the observing mind is now ready to observe whatever else needs to be observed. So you can come back to the silence and just sit in the silence or, sorry, come back to the breath and observe the sensation of the in-breath and the out-breath. So that's, that's the, one of the best techniques. Um, I share this everywhere I go in the world. And people find it very, very helpful to be able to label thinking, thinking, thinking. Yep. So when you label something as thinking, 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 you say this in your mind, right? You know, <laughs> you, you, think of, you think of this in your mind, but that's thinking. It's not thinking. It's, it's only a single word. So if you think about a thought, a thought is usually a story. 
and it's got a subject and it's, you know, something's going on in the story. To say thinking, one single word, it's not really a thought, it's a concept, it's a word, but it does, there's no story evolved in it. And there's no, I'm not saying I am thinking, so it's not a sentence, there's no I in it, it's just process, thinking, thinking, thinking. So, if you, in that way, there is, it's not really a thought, but it is a concept. So it's a word. Yeah. So what if I imagine the word? <laughs> I usually imagine the word. You see the word written, yeah. thinking, T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we might do that. Some people will, because we've been taught this from when we were tiny little kids, Sometimes our parents drilled us into the ABC and the alphabet and then we live in a world of words and letters and concepts and, and such. So when I say the word thinking, I might see the word actually kind of printed on my mind. But that's okay too. That's coming back to uh, clearing the screen of the mind, but that's another little different level of tweaking the mind. But for now, it doesn't matter if you see the word thinking, thinking, thinking come up in the mind. That's not a problem. It's what you're doing is, again, we are not killing the thought. We're not stopping the thought, but we're just noticing, realizing, oh, this is just thinking. So really, there must be wisdom associated with this that is just realizing this is just another thought. I don't, I didn't come here to think. You know, I'm sitting in meditation. I don't need to think anything right now. This is just thinking, thinking, thinking. So it's objective. It's not saying thinking is bad and, you know, I am thinking so I'm bad and, you know, I'm a bad meditator. It's not loaded. It's just saying thought process, thinking, thinking, thinking. That's all it is. And quite often, because the mind becomes objective, the thought falls away. When the thought's gone and the labeling's gone, now what do you want to do with your mind? You have the power of your mind. You have a pure mind. What do you want to do? Do you want to observe your breath? Do you want to sit in silence? Do you want to just, um, yeah, do you want to experience nothingness or emptiness or space? You know, many Buddha's teachings interpretations of the Buddha's teachings, especially Zen, Zen Buddhism. One of their main goals is to come to emptiness, to actually experience pure emptiness, emptiness in body and mind. So you can achieve this as, an, as a brief experience rather quickly, even just by that technique, when you're thinking and then you label thinking, 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 and then you realize, I can't label thinking anymore because there's no thought left. The thought's gone, the label's gone. Where are you? What's left? And at that moment, even if it's one moment, you can experience an emptiness, a space in the mind. It's simple. Yes. Correct. Right, but a mantra is ongoing. This can be thinking, hearing, feeling, smelling, tasting, and that's no way, that's nothing to do with a mantra. A mantra is Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Padme Hom, Om Mani Om, 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 Om. Same syllable, same repetition for a long period of time. So it's, it's nothing like a, a mantra, but um, certainly it is a, a type, it, there is a recognition, so there is a mental activity, but it's very limited and it's very small activity. And as I've tried to explain, it's not even thinking. Really, it's just that is 
So there are other ways you can label. For example, if you see pictures in your mind when you're thinking, then you could say imagining, imagining, imagining. So for me, I don't see the word thinking in my mind. Um, ah, no, when I think, I usually think in pictures. I'm very graphic, I'm very imaginative. So it, when I was a kid and growing up, I didn't want to read books, I wanted to watch movies. So I didn't want to see all the words and have to put all that together by myself. I just watch a movie because the movie tells me everything. So I'm very visual. So when I was labeling thinking, I had to often label imagining, imagining, imagining. Because my mind kept getting stuck in the pictures and the, the videos and the scenarios, uh, scenarios of the future or memories of the past or replaying old videos. So that was how my mind was working. So I had to label imagining, imagining. But then my mind, the wisdom of my mind would cut in and say, ah, oh, you're doing this again. This is not necessary. This is not what I came here to do. This is not meditation. Fantasizing and imagining and seeing pictures and making up stories in my mind. So when I labeled imagining, imagining, it would clear. Okay, now the mind's clear. What do I want to do with a clear mind? Then I come back to my meditation object or come back to the breath or sit in that, that space or whatever. So however your mind works, whether you're a, a, a words person or a visual person, by labeling it, you can at least temporarily have a break from that process. The thoughts will pass away, the words will pass away, the stories will pass away. Sometimes if you're a talking person, you're often hearing yourself talking in your head. Most of us are probably like this. So you can even label hearing, hearing, hearing. Because you're hearing yourself talking. You're actually talking in your head, having conversations in your head, past conversations, future conversations. Even I used to, I caught myself um, talking to my teacher about my experience in the present moment. So I've got some pain going on in my leg and then I'm explaining what's happening in my leg to my teacher. So I was like saying, Oh, and Siado, this pain was doing this and it was like stretching and pulling and something. And then I thought, what is this? This is madness. I'm talking to my teacher in my head about something that I'm going to say to him in the future was happening here and now in the present. So I had to just like delete all of this and just come back to the experience. And that's when the Vipassana is really practiced not just the mental stuff. We've got one at the back first, yeah. Right. I have a question regarding, you mentioned that when you meditate, you might like, almost like fall asleep like that. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I experienced that a lot. Um, for me, it's more like when I'm very focused on my breathing, the, the thoughts kind of uh, disappear. But the focus also disappears, so it's as if I'm a bit losing my consciousness a bit then, when I start to realize that I'm uh, falling down a bit. Right. Do you have a, maybe a better solution to actually tackle this kind of thing? Because I do realize that I'm a bit tired today. Yeah. So, yeah, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah. So, as I said, everybody's tired. We're all tired. So, it's not just today. Um, if you tried to meditate tomorrow, it would be the same. Um, and also, it's one of the problems of doing like a little day retreat. I mean, you've just been working all week and then you had to get busy and ready and come here this morning. So you, you're tired. We're all pretty much tired. So um, sleepiness in meditation is usually caused by thinking. Normally what happens first is the mind slips into a thought and because the thought becomes very comfortable, then the mind drops out. And it's just, it's kind of like, oh, like that. So, and that's why it happens so very quickly. You might be, because I often, I saw it in myself, but then I used to ask people about it. And then they would say, 
um, oh no, but I was, I was watching the rising and falling of the abdomen, I was watching my breath, I was meditating, but um, even so, very quickly, and thoughts are very fast, and that's why I said we probably have 60 million, not just 60,000 thoughts in a day, they are so fast, the Buddha didn't even give a simile for the speed of the mind because he said the mind is the, the fastest thing that is known. So faster than light, faster than anything else is the speed of the mind. So you can have a thought faster than you even know that you're having a thought. So the mind quickly goes into a thought if it's a comfortable, relaxing thought, bang, you're into sleep and it happens in a finger snap. So it is thinking. So the best thing is to be vigilant and guard or watch for thinking in the mind. So in Vipassana, a lot of our practice is awareness of thinking process, which is a very unusual meditation uh, instruction is to be aware of thinking. Most in meditation instructions will say, stop thinking, go back to your meditation object, or avoid thinking. But in Vipassana, thinking becomes part of the meditation. Awareness of thinking. And this is a very different instruction. To the extent where sometimes what we're doing in the practice is really watching thoughts. Like as if you were a cat sitting at, the, at a mouse hole, waiting for the mouse to come out of the mouse hole, and you just sit there. How alert is this cat? The cat's very alert. It's like waiting for the mouse to come out. So in your mind, you could sit and say, when's my next thought? and just wait and watch. And when a thought arises, you're aware of it. And as soon as you're aware of it, it disappears. It's like the mouse comes out, sticks its head out, sees a big cat and goes meow, and goes back in. The thoughts also do the same thing. This is a really interesting practice. Thinking meditation. You won't hear that term very often. Thinking meditation. Mindfulness of thinking, awareness of thinking, watching the mind, if it, especially if it's in its silence and stillness, and you're sitting in that silence and stillness and you're just waiting for a thought to arise. It's like sitting in a forest. I remember there was a book by Ajahn Chah, one of the great Thai forest monks that I believe was enlightened. One of his books was called a still forest pool. Maybe you've seen it. It's been around for a long time. A still forest pool. Now imagine walking through beautiful, lush, green forest, and you come to an open space, and there's a pool of water, natural, perfectly crystal clear, perfectly uh, calm pool of water. The, the surface of the water is just like glass or like a mirror reflecting everything above it. And it's so still. And you just sit down and you just watch the surface of the water. And you allow your mind to become one with the surface of the water. As if your mind and the surface of the water were the same thing. And if your mind is that still, imagine if a little fish just went blip, you would see it. And the rings of the water would move out from that and it would come back to stillness. Or imagine if a leaf falls down from a tree and just lands on the surface of the water. You see it very clearly because everything's still. But one little movement, one thing happens, and you see very clearly exactly what happens. This is how sharp and how clear the mind can become. And you can have developed this ability 
to watch this clarity of your own mind. But it takes practice. And it's not just... It's not just um, going through a technique. Most meditations that you are taught are techniques and you just do the technique. I've met people who've been doing the technique for decades. But all they're doing is the technique. They just keep repeating the technique. But they're not actually understanding what they're getting from the technique. In that way, the technique is actually is not very useful. I won't say it's useless, but it's not very useful. So just sitting and following a technique, it's good because you're not out there doing bad, unwholesome things in the world. You, you're doing a nice thing. You're not hurting anybody and you're practicing a technique. But really all you're doing is going through the motions, going through the technique of meditation. But you're not actually achieving the state of meditation. And sometimes what people have to do is throw away the bloody technique and just see what's left when there's no technique. Because all they're doing is following a technique. I know because I followed techniques for decades. And I followed this technique and that technique and I did lots of different techniques. And then I came to realize the technique can actually become the problem. Because I'm doing a technique, all I'm doing is doing a technique. And then my ego gets attached. Oh, I do this technique. What technique do you do? Oh, my technique's better than your technique. What's this? Oh, we are, I belong to the group of the ones who do this technique. And oh, they're the ones who do that technique. Oh, you know, our, don't talk to that group over there because their techniques does that and our technique does this. It's all just techniques. And you find this in Buddhism, you find it in Christianity and, and, and all sorts of other, in businesses and everything. You know, we're the ones that wear the blue suits and, you know, they're the ones who wear the green suits and the green suits think they're better than the blue suits and all this sort of stuff. But that's, that's not the point. It was never the point. The point is that each one of us is a unique human being and we're all having our unique experience and what is it that is at the essence of your experience? What is it, what is the consciousness that is operating in your experience in this moment? So in order to access your true nature, your true essence, it's kind of like you have to go through. This is why they say, let go of things. So we often hear this in the teachings, but there even comes to a point where you have to let go of your meditation. You, even the Buddha said, if I'm not mistaken, that you have to let go of even him, because there were some people at the time of the Buddha were so fixated on the Buddha that he, he pointed them out and called them out and said, you're not doing the right thing. You just keep looking at me. You have to look at yourself. Following me isn't the path. You have to see yourself. You have to find your own truth. And it's not just the Dharma that is taught that we have to follow and, and recognize. We use that, but we're not looking for that. We're looking for our own truth, our own Dharma, our own experience. And this is where you become, you actually become free. By the way, that's my name. When I was born, my parents called me Jeffrey, yeah? Jeffrey, yeah? So all my life I was called Jeff. It's a really boring name. It has absolutely no meaning whatsoever, Jeff. But the second half of my name is free. And I teach freestyle vipassana. I teach freedom of mind. Buddha was teaching freedom of mind. So. If you'd like to be my friend and you'd like to call me by the name that I'd like to be called by, because I know you all have your Chinese names and you have your own little nicknames, mine is Free. So please call me Free. 
Okay? Don't put a K on the end of it, because then I'd be a freak. Okay? <laughs> I am maybe a freak, I'm not sure, but yeah. So, but please feel free to call me free. Um, and you can become free in your mind if you see how your mind is attached to many different things. It's attached to concepts, it's attached to practices, it's attached to labels, it's attached to people, it's attached to things. And we're not saying get rid of them all and cut them all off and not have them, because that's, that's not the right way to practice. What the Buddha was teaching is to realize that if you understand, it's a very deep teaching by the Buddha, but it makes what the Buddha's teaching is very unique. He taught anatta. Anatta is not self or no self. If you can understand that, then you realize if there is no self, a, a non-self cannot own anything and it cannot be attached to anything. There is no attachment. There's no such thing as attachment. But because I think I'm permanent, because I think I am who I am, then I erroneously, mistakenly, ignorantly, I'm attached to things. And I, sitting here, Mr. Free Oliver, I cannot say that I'm not attached to things. I am actually still attached to things. But when I see very clearly and I use my Dharma power, my Dharma wisdom, I know very clearly there's no way that I can be attached to anything. It's actually impossible because there is no self. And if there's no self, then there's no attachment. There's nothing that can attach to anything else. It just doesn't work. That equation doesn't work. But if I'm a self, then yes, I will attach to something. But if I'm a non-self, how can it attach to something? It just doesn't make sense. So when you really understand the Buddha's teachings, then you will understand there is no attachment and then you actually can become free from suffering. Another way to access this is by impermanence. To realize that every experience that you have is in a process of change. Listening to me now is just a process. Your hearing is a process of change. Your hearing is a process of change. Your senses are a process of change. Your thinking is a process of change. Your emotions are a process of change. Everything that you experience, moment to moment or in a continuous flow, is in a process of change. Therefore, attach to what? How to attach to something if it's impermanent? How you keep something if it's impermanent? You can't keep anything. Attach to what? Am I attached? At, how can I attach to a sound? Is it possible? How can I attach to a sensation? Oh, it's so nice to feel its touch or something. But you touch, it's finished. Then what? How to attach to that? It's just an experience. How you t taste something. We're going to go for lunch soon. So, when you taste something, how to be attached to that taste? Yes, in the sense that, oh, this beautiful, yummy mango or whatever it is, oh, I want to have more. Yes, that's attachment. But the taste itself slides and disappears. And the smells disappear. So everything at your senses is in a process of disappearing. There's nothing you can do about that. It's always been this way. It's been the same way for every human being that stepped foot on the planet. All your senses are all in a process of dissolution. They are dissolving right now as we speak. It must be this way. So again, logically, attached to what? Attached to a smell? Attached to a taste? Attached to a sight? Okay, you see something beautiful. Then you can say, oh, I want to keep looking at this, this beautiful thing. But every time you look, it's a new experience of looking. So every time you look, that experience of looking 
disappears, it dissolves. When you look away, you look back, it's a new experience. It also will dissolve. You can't just look at something beautiful for the rest of your life and like live your life like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's like, what's that? So, it's interesting when we get down to this word, this meaning of this word attachment, and that the attachment is causing the suffering. The Buddha said that if you remove the attachment, you remove the suffering. But if you understand that in, in truth, you can't actually be attached, then this is, it, it just, it helps everything to become more free. And even though, as a self, you may forget that you are free and that you are attached to something, but you will also uh, have your reminders. You might remind yourself, you might have Dharma friends, you might have teachings that you refer back to that will remind you, no, actually, your intrinsic nature is that you are free. Your consciousness is free. Actually, your mind also is free. We are free from everything. So, thank you. <laughs> what time did you want to have lunch? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, just, I wanted to share an experience I had just now when I was meditating because I found it very interesting. Um, so usually when I go for these like, meditation sessions or the retreats, I might have some sort of pain and I tend to verbalize it in my head. So I, like, if I have a back pain, I can say that I'll, in my head I'll complain about it, but I wouldn't actually talk to it about anyone else. Uh, what I realized is that these thoughts are very spontaneous. But when I asked the question, um, what's my next thought? First of all, uh, there was no thought, which was a bit surprising. So, and then there was one instance where I did actually have a thought, but that was like one of the first times where I was so aware that the thought was entering my head. So um, when I said, what's my next thought? And then suddenly I stopped like a warmness here and I knew that I was going to start completing my head about the, the pain in my back. So I, I felt it come in and then I felt it leave. So I was, I'm not usually aware about the entrance and exit of thoughts. I know that I had it, but it tends to disappear without me even realizing in the end. So this is the first time I was like aware about it. And it kind of was interesting because I realized like the power of self-awareness and how it can actually help to, to realize the thoughts and they more naturally come and go. Yeah, fantastic. I hope you understood what he was just saying. That, and quite often, many pe uh, quite often people will have this experience that when they practice meditation, they happen to get certain pains in the body that they only get in meditation. I personally get one right in the middle of my back, and I only get it when I meditate. I don't get it at other times, and I don't think it's just my, my sitting posture. Maybe it is, but it, I call them meditation pains. They only come up it's like little friends that come to visit you when, you, when you're meditating. And, um, but what was, I really like that process that you, that you just explained because you, you did see that when you asked the question, what's my next thought, you saw that there was a space in the mind and then you saw that there was a thought about to arise and it, it, it backed off. Was that, was that it? Did it, did it come? Seconds before I right. That, oh, that's a thought really. So I, yep. I concluded it. Yeah, and then it, yeah. But then when you saw the pain arising, you remembered, I'm going to complain about this. So you actually th saw a thought before it arose. You saw the cause for the thought. And by seeing the cause for the thought, that is the complaining about the pain, actually that thought didn't arise. And because that didn't arise, the complaining about the pain didn't arise. And so actually the pain then was given an open door to leave. And that's what it did. It actually passed away. So it's a really beautiful process. And you can have these, many of these experiences 
through vipassana meditation and it is happening because of awareness of thinking our thoughts you've heard of psychosomatic diseases and that actually our mind can create diseases and illnesses and pains in the body in fact there are those people that would say all of your physical ailments are caused by your mind i'm not sure about that i think sometimes there may be physical things that something physical can cause something physical but somehow ultimately it's true because your mind made a decision to be in this particular place at this time to do this and therefore somehow you made a decision to have this experience and therefore even if something physical happens um it's you made a decision to be here so it's still caused by your mind anyway um if you can see that your mind when a pain is arising and you can see that your mind is complaining about it worried about it afraid of it um uh disappointed by it there are actually a whole range of mental states that arise with pain now if you can start labeling them and actually naming them what are the different names that you could give to the mental states that arise when you feel pain i just named some of them there but can when you feel for example you feel disappointed because this pain just keeps coming back you thought it was gone and it's come back so disappointed and you say to yourself disappointed disappointed not just labeling it but you take a moment to just feel what is this disappointment and you experience disappointment you're not saying go away disappointment i don't want to be disappointed um you're not over analyzing this disappointment like intellectualizing oh, where what is this what is this disappointment about where does it come from you know how can i do 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 you're not thinking about the disappointment you just experience disappointment normally in your life you won't do this you won't just experience a mental state or an emotion you'll be doing something with it you'll be either indulged in it and lost in it or you'll be fighting with it trying to get rid of it or distract yourself away from it or something but in vipassana we then say ah this is disappointment let me now learn what is disappointment and sit in the disappointment feel it experience it don't run away from it don't shut it down don't try to stop it don't suppress it don't do anything with it don't control it cuz that's what you do in your ordinary life and we do the same with pain a pain comes up in your body and you're like oh you know how can i get rid of this or you know call your mom mom i've got a pain in my leg how can i what can i do or you go to the massage therapist or you know you buy some medicine for it or you you got to get rid of this pain in vipassana we just say ah welcome and you sit with the pain you feel the pain you experience the pain in a view to understand the pain what is pain why does pain arise what's the cause for pain why does pain arise why does pain last for some time why does pain disappear if you sit with it for a while the pain will disappear by itself and so the pain is one of the best teachers you can have in your life because it's actual suffering it's physical suffering and it's a teacher and then you get all the mental states that arise around that pain and all of those are your teachers your impatience your frustration your anger your fear your worry your stress all of these are your teachers if you want to learn so we will come back to that but what we're going to do is we're going to i'm going to introduce eating meditation to you so since we're on a little retreat on my retreats 
So I run retreats. I've just finished running four retreats in Bali and uh, having people coming from all different countries, mostly Russians and Ukrainians, believe it or not. Um, you know, there's a war in Ukraine at the moment and the Russians invaded Ukraine. I get Russians and Ukrainians sitting on my meditations retreats, sitting side by side, because these Russians don't want to invade Ukraine. And the Ukrainians don't want the Russians to invade. Actually, these people sitting here on this retreat, they don't have a problem with each other. There's not a problem. There never was a problem. But the governments created a problem. And so Ukrainians found themselves hating Russians, whereas before they didn't hate them. So, and then they've started to realize, well, we don't have to hate each other. Just because something's happening you know, over there, it doesn't ha have to affect my relationship with you here now personally, because you as a person and me as a person, we don't actually have a problem. So anyway, on my retreats, um, I like to introduce eating meditation. I don't know what style of food is down there. I don't know how it's being presented. Um, is it coming in takeaway containers? Right, okay, all right. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, good. Um, so, do you know what you're going to eat for lunch? No? Okay, good. I was just testing, yeah. Maybe she knows, I don't know, but maybe someone knows. Um, so we don't know. So you remind yourself, I don't know what I'm going to, I, know, I don't know what's going to happen. So, and you don't know, even you open the box and look inside, you might say, oh, it's kwetio, or it's, you know, this or that or whatever, but you don't know what it tastes like. And, you know, you might say, oh, I don't like those things, or I don't like this, or, you know, oh, I'm, I'm not going to eat that, I'll just eat this. But you don't know until you eat it. So what I want you to do, I want you to, I want you to go to lunch really consciously aware of being just open-minded. That whatever it is, I'm just going to accept it as it is. So you know, I lived as a Buddhist monk for nine years. A lot of my um, practice, not a lot, but a certain part of my practice was to go for arms round. Monks in my monasteries didn't need to go to arms round because our teacher was quite famous and rich people used to come and offer fantastic food at the monastery. I think our monastery in Burma was probably the best restaurant in Myanmar. Like the food was just absolutely amazing and we were very spoiled. So, you know, that was kind of nice, but I chose not to eat there for that reason. And I used to go out into the suburbs and the villages around and just accept alms food. And I used to go in a different direction every day so that people couldn't prepare food for me so they didn't know that I was coming. So I would, um, so I, of course I never knew what I was going to get. And eating only one meal a day as well. So whatever you got in your bowl, that was your meal for the day. And you just, you make the most of it. Some days you get a lot of really nice, yummy, you know, healthy stuff and other days you just get a bowl of rice and some peanuts and a bit of this and a bit of that or something. So, really today as you approach food, these days we're so spoiled. You guys are all so spoiled. You've got food at hand everywhere you go in Malaysia. Everywhere. You can always get food and you can get whatever you want, basically. So we don't really respect food and we don't really take time to really appreciate where did this food come from? Not just how much did it cost or which stall did it come from or something like that, but actually the ingredients of the food and the work that's gone into creating this food. So, 
I would like to think that we eat food as medicine and not just for taste or flavor or enjoyment or satisfaction. Food, even if it doesn't taste nice, if it's healthy and it's good for your body, then you can appreciate it. In fact, I appreciate food that doesn't taste good but is healthy for my body, I appreciate that more than just sitting down to some healthy, uh, sorry, some tasty food, but it's not actually healthy for my body. Now, I'd prefer to eat healthy but not tasty than to eat unhealthy and tasty. But you can see in the world these days, it's all about taste. It's all about taste. And that's, and people don't care what oil it was fried in or what preservatives or other things they put in it. They don't, they don't care and they don't want to know. They just want the tastiest one. And this is not good for our health. So you have, I can see all of you are of a Chinese descent somewhere, somehow. <laughs> So, you have an amazing, amazing culture of traditional Chinese medicines and many of those medicines are actually foods. And so those foods, when they're incorporated, uh, those medicines, when they're incorporated into foods, actually make you healthy and you can enjoy them. It's like in India, they have Ayurveda. Ayurveda is um, not exclusively, but it's food um, food as medicine or medicine as food. And that's how I want to live my life. Of course, as some people may see, I'll even, I'll have my coffee or I'll have a, a, some bread or something like this as well. But otherwise, I'd prefer to eat food as medicine. So, when you go to your food today, um, Take a little while to sit with the food before you just start tucking into it. Sit for a little while. Maybe just sit with the food in front of you. Maybe just close your eyes for a little while. Perhaps we can do this together. We can all just sit and I can guide it as we do it down there. If you like, smell the food. Be aware of your senses. When you eat, you, are, you actually have the taste sense. So sitting here meditating, we don't usually taste very much, of course. But when you're doing eating meditation, then you can incorporate this sense of taste. When you take, so we'll even select just one little piece of food and we'll just eat that with our eyes closed. And we'll just be aware of the taste, the texture, the temperature, and all of the experiences that unfold just in eating one piece of food. So I think what I'll do is, um, so when you go down, you get a packet, just put the packet on the table in front of you, do whatever else you need to do, but don't start eating yet, okay? So then I'll just guide us through a, a short meditation, a little introduction to eating mindfully, and then you can do what you want to do, yeah? Okay, so in about five minutes or so, will be down which floor? Lower ground. Lower, lower ground. So uh, if you take the stairs, go a little bit slowly, try to feel. So most of us are barefoot now because we're in here, we took our shoes off. Taking the stairs is a wonderful way to have exercise in your life. I currently live on the seventh floor of the apartment that I live in. I haven't used the lift for, I think, over a week. Uh, I go in and out probably twice a day. So, and when I go to the lower ground, so that would be nine floors. So I walk up and down uh, nine floors whenever I come and go. So I'm not bragging or boasting, but I want to be fit. I'm getting old, like you're all getting old. Some of you think you're not getting old. Actually, I think I'm not getting old, but I, I guess I have to admit it. Um, but if I keep 
using my body and exercising my body, then I'll continue to be strong. So um, using the stairs, there are many benefits. One, of course, is you're using your leg muscles and your body muscles to walk up and down the stairs. Also, it's a little bit aerobic, especially when you're going up, you, you will find that you will be breathing more. So you need to breathe more and you can start to incorporate taking the stairs with your breaths, almost like maybe one step per breath or two steps one breath or something like that. So <clears throat> then it actually becomes a meditation, especially when you're going up many, many stairs and there's nothing going on in the stairs. Did you notice there's, well, you wouldn't notice because you probably don't use the stairs, but there's usually nobody else in the stairs. So there's no distractions. There's nothing pretty there. There's nothing to look at. There's nothing to entertain you or distract you. You keep your phone in your pocket. And so from the ground floor, up to wherever you're going, you actually get time to do a little meditation. So there are three benefits right there. One, you're getting physical exercise. Two, you are, um, you're doing the breathing, so you're, you're getting your aerobic exercise as well, but then you can do meditation while you're walking up and down the stairs as well. So good for body and mind. So I invite you to use the stairs here. You don't have to, of course, but um, it's quite a few floors down, so it's a good little journey. Try and feel each touch of each step. Can you take one step without thinking? Ah, there's a challenge. So I said, can you take a breath without a thought? Can you take a step without a thought? If you can take one, can you take two? How many steps can you take without thinking? You don't have to count the steps, but how long does that experience of not thinking and just feeling last? I do this when I'm swimming as well. I see if I can swim from one end of the pool to the other end of the pool without any thought. Can I take one stroke without a thought? Yeah. Can I take another stroke without a thought? Yeah. Okay. How many strokes? Not by counting, but how long can that experience continue until again I start thinking oh wow that was a long time oh wow I'm doing really well oh this was great oh blah 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 ah okay that's thinking okay let me do it again so walking to the lower ground or however you go there is also meditation just take your time I'll give you a, a, a cute little walking meditation technique when you walk, just say to yourself, happy, healthy, happy, healthy, yeah? So as you walk, it'll slow you down a little bit and just say to yourself, happy, healthy, happy, healthy. It's a little metta, loving kindness that you can do while you're walking and you can actually continue that out into your life as well. It helps you to slow down. You know, we, we rush too much in this life. So... It's not nice to slow down for a change. <coughs> so you can try a little walking meditation on your way to lunch. And then when you get your lunch, just sit down and we'll do a little eating meditation together. Okay. Thanks everybody for listening.